Intel's 14th gen CPUs are here, and, well, they're pretty much just the 13th gen chips with a new name. Seriously, it's the same architecture, it's Raptor Lake S, it's the same process node, Intel 7, and with this 14600K in particular, there's very little difference. It still has 14 total cores, 6P and 8E cores, it still has 24 megabytes of total cache, it still boosts to a maximum of 5.3 gigahertz, it still has a max turbo power of 181 watts. The only spec sheet difference I can find is that the E cores can now boost to 4 gigahertz instead of 3.9 gigahertz. Game changing, I know! There really isn't much new here. There's a few bits like a new AI assistant built into their extreme tuning utility software and application optimization, or APU, which basically does some under the hood tweaks uh, based on the game's executable name, but realistically both of those things could work on the older chips, but Intel obviously wants to keep them for the new stuff to make it worth you buying the newer one. Of course, there is always more beyond just the specs, so let's dive straight into the benchmarks, and this time I'm going to start with the gaming results. I should note here that for a number of reasons, including it being a more realistic choice for this chip and because I don't have anything better, I'm using an RTX 3070 Ti for this testing. I'm testing at what I would consider realistic settings in each of the games as well, and using the best kit of RAM I have access to, that being a Kingston Fury DR5 5600CL40 CL40 set, and I'm using the latest public BIOS version of the ASUS Z790 Strix E board that I've been testing with, and otherwise stock BIOS settings, save for using the XMP1 profile, and dynamic tuning technology is enabled. That does mean that power limits are removed, but that's the stock setting on this board, and in fact most of them, and it's how I imagine most people will be using these chips, so that's what I'm sticking with. It's the same board, RAM, cooler, and GPU for all of these tests, so hopefully that is as controlled enough for you as I can do. Right, let's get into the games. I'll start with the new kid on the block, CS2. Now it's worth pointing out that CS2 is still very much in the public beta stage, as much as Valve would have you believe otherwise. So take these results with a pinch of salt, in fact take them all with a pinch of salt anyway, and should you always use multiple sources? Anyway, with that said, while the 13th and 14th gen chips do hold a comfortable lead over the 12th gen i5, the gap between the 13th and 14th isn't nearly as big. Although, it is there. All of these results are more than playable though. At 1440p, the gap to the 12600K remains roughly the same, but the distance between the 13600K and the 14600K shrinks to under 10 FPS, and at over 400 FPS average, that's not what you would call uh, noticeable. Cyberpunk on medium settings at 1080p is the same story. The 12600K is about 25 FPS slower than the 13th and 14th gen chips, while those two only share a 2 FPS difference. There is no significant improvement between the now previous generation and this new one. As expected, 1440p flattens those results even more, with only a 3 FPS spread across all three chips. There is a notable difference in the 1% low figures though, with the 12600K running 10 FPS lower than the other two, meaning you'd likely get a smoother experience on the 13th or 14th gen chips. Microsoft Flight Simulator is a really interesting one, as the 14600K actually ran 6 FPS slower than the 13600K. I made sure to retest this, but at least with my setup and hardware and configuration, it was a repeatable result. It's hardly a big difference, and Intel's own slides show some games have a little bit of performance regression too, so I'm not that worried. Of course, the 12600K is at the back of the pack, running 15 FPS slower than the 14600K and 20 FPS slower than the 13600K. At 1440p, things are back to normal, and the 14600K is in the lead, just, and the 12600K is running behind 
at around 15 fps lower. Fortnite at 1080p on the high preset with no TSR was pretty strange. Basically all of the results were capped 106 fps, give or take uh, half a frame? <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty weird. 1440p isn't much better, again all are within 1 FPS of each other, although strangely the 13600K has slightly lower 1% lows in both 1080p and 1440p results. Hitman 3 is great because it breaks out the CPU and GPU performance. So this is the CPU results and at medium settings at 1080p we can finally see a notable improvement from the newest 14th gen chip. It isn't exactly that much, it's under 10 FPS, but it's an improvement nevertheless. The gap to the 12600K is still there too, with a little over 15 FPS between that and the 13600K. 1440p brings all of that down though, where the 14600K and 13600K are really very close, just 3 FPS between them. Even the 12600K has caught up and now is only 10 FPS or so behind. Rainbow Six Siege is back to normal, with the 14600K just ahead of the 13600K, followed by a fairly large gap to the 12600K. All of these results are perfectly playable though, so I wouldn't exactly be worried if you do have a 12600K. At 1440p the gap is even closer, with the 12600K just 20 FPS behind the 13th gen chip and just 5 FPS uh, in terms of a gap to the 14600K. There's really not that much in it. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is the same story. At 1080p there is only a 2 FPS gap between the two Raptor Lake chips, or 4 FPS in the 1% lows. The 12600K does trail by the usual margin, running around 20 FPS slower, but at 180 and 200 FPS respectively, I can't say that's a deal breaking amount of performance. At 1440p they may as well all be the same chip, like seriously, the 1% lows and averages are functionally identical, showing a complete GPU bottleneck. Lastly, in Starfield, on the low presets, because how else are you going to play this damn game, there is a reasonable amount of differentiation. The 13600K is lacking in the 1% lows again, although on average it's pretty close to the newer 14600K. The 12600K trails again by the usual amount, this time only around 10 FPS average compared to the 13600K, and with actually better 1% lows than the 13th gen chip. At 1440p it's a similar story, albeit with less performance on tap as a whole. The 1% lows on the 13600K are still a little low compared to the other two chips, but otherwise it's pretty close. To summarise all of those results, here is the percentage differences at 1080p comparing the 14600K to the 12600K. On average, the 14600K is about 17% faster, with the highlights being CS2, Hitman 3 and Rainbow Six Siege. Now if I swap that to compare the 14600K to the 13600K, that's a lot less impressive. On average, the 14600K is just 1.9% faster across these 8 games. That's just abysmal. At 1440p, the 14600K is 9.4% faster than the 12600K and just 1.1% faster than the 13600K. Yikes. Of course, we need to talk about the CPU workloads, so let's take a look at those two, starting with Cinebench. Single threaded performance has improved ever so slightly, which adds up to under a thousand points more in the all core workload. It's nowhere near the improvement that the 12th gen to 13th gen saw, uh, as you should now probably expect. Blender is the same, a frankly marginal improvement from 13th to 14th, but a significant improvement from 12th to 13th. Puget Bench for the Adobe apps, namely Premiere Pro, After Effects and Photoshop, all show the 13th and 14th gen chips are functionally identical, uh, technically trading blows slightly, 
while the 12600K trails behind, and somewhat significantly in fact. Lastly, looking at power consumption, both the stable uh, on load power and the peak power draw are very much similar for the two newest chips. The highest peak I saw was 155 watts on the 14600K and 153 watts on the 13600K. Really, a slight overclock to the 13600K would provide all of the performance and then some that the 14600K provides. In CPU specific tasks, the 14600K is just 2.6% faster than the 13th gen. So, what the hell is going on here? Well, if I'm being blunt, this is a shareholder launch. This isn't a look at this awesome new thing that we've made that you should buy type of launch. This is a we're a massive multi-billion dollar corporation and if we don't keep up our yearly launch cycle, our stock price is going to drop and our execs won't get their stock price related bonuses this year type of launch. There is functionally nothing new here, save for the i7 which now gets more e-cores. That's about it. This is a stopgap until they can get the legitimately interesting stuff, that being Meteor Lake and video explaining all of that in the cards above, I highly recommend you check out because it's really cool and I can't wait for those, into production. So what chips should you buy? Well I guess either the 13600K or the 14600K, whichever is cheaper because they're the same thing. These new chips don't even require a BIOS update to boot. And that kind of tells you all you need to know. So that should hopefully answer your question if you were even asking it. And uh, yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. What do you think about these new chips? Or I don't know if we can really even call them that new. Uh, but let me know what you think in the comments down below. If you are interested, I'll leave links to at least the 13th and the 14th gen chips in the description if you're interested. If you want to support these videos, you can do so through hitting the subscribe button, turn on the bell notification icon, or check out plenty of links in the description for merch or hoodies or t-shirts like this one. You can pick up my own hardware, the open source latency and response time testing tools at osrtt.com. And otherwise, that's kind of it. Check out plenty of other videos on the end cards, including that Meteor Lake video. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend checking it out. And yeah, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you on the next video.